So ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure and honor to welcome you in our school, Anatolical School of Theology, EST. It's really, I feel really privileged that we can uh, today have such a wonderful guest, uh, Sister Teresa Focades. Yeah, did I pronounce it right? Yeah. Okay, not easy. Uh, and uh, today's uh, event, today's meeting is titled Faith and uh, Gender. Tomorrow we'll be continuing this uh, discussion, talk, which we have today, and will be culture and gender. And I would like also to invite you for the event uh, tomorrow. I'm sure it will be really wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for accepting the invitation, for taking time and coming here. You're a special guest here. I know I should be introducing you particularly, but let us stay with just general introduction. We are all friends, equal, one family, whatever. Feel like at home. And uh, your, our doors of our school are always open for you, with any occasion, without any occasion. You are always welcome and special. And today's event is a part of a broader project that is organized by uh, House of Foundation and organized by our school, EST, and it's called Education, Religion, Culture, Education. And this very event really starts a cycle of uh, four or more meetings with uh, four contemporary, important, renowned theologians. Sister Teresa Forcades, Manuela Kalski, Thomas Bremer, and Micha de Winter. Yeah? Uh, and uh, during these events or these meetings, we would like to take a look and really analyze from different perspectives the writings and thoughts of various of four famous uh, theologians connected somehow with Wrocław Breslau, namely uh, Edith Stein, Katarina Staric, Beno Jakob, and D.G. Popover. <coughs> and I already would like to invite you for this event. I'm sure it will be really wonderful and important. We will be, we'll have this wonderful opportunity to listen to our guests, to learn from them, but also to express our understandings of well, our contemporary reality. And to say straightforwardly, we'll have this wonderful opportunity to ask a few fundamental questions, not always easy, not always comfortable, but the kind of questions that it's really difficult to get away from in our contemporary world. And in, during today's meeting, we'll be coping, especially the thought of Edith Stein and Katarina Steitz. It's a special occasion, as our guest is a special person, Sister Teresa Forcades. And I'm, I'm aware that those who are interested in uh, contemporary theology, especially theology in its feministic dimension, and those who read Gazeta Wyborcza, I do not need to introduce Sister Forcades in details. However, let me say a few words. Yes, and I have now a lecture. <coughs> so Sister Forcades, Teresa Forcades, is a Benedictine nun. Yes. Yet. Uh, yeah. oh, sorry. No, I'm just kidding. Yes. No, I'm, just kidding. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it's my fault. It's not a few more. I know, it's nasty. Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I was meaning yes, not yet. <laughs> and social activist, and she's a an, uh, graduate of, uh, among others, uh, the University of Barcelona and uh, Harvard University and the uh, uh, School of Theology of Catalonia and Sister for Cabez. For, for Cabez has two PhDs, one in the area of public health, 2005, and uh, University of Barcelona. The other is 2009 theology and uh, school fundamental theology. Uh, sounds very bad. Uh, 2009 School of Theology in Catalonia. Wonderful. And she's an author of many publications, and among them are uh, three, in my opinion, very important books. Uh, Trinity Today, The Crimes of Big Pharmaceutical Companies and Feminist Theology in History. So, it's wonderful. And what I really, personally, what I really appreciate in the attitude of Sister Forcades is her courage and, uh, well, her openness in dealing with issues that are important in today's world. And, uh, well, they are not always comfortable, not always comfortable for the institutions, and I understand that Sister represents uh, well, so uh, 
Teresa Forcades, uh, advocates the independence of Catalonia, now as the leader of the uh, process constituent movement, yes. And uh, she criticizes big uh, pharmaceutical companies for their uh, social manipulations. And I remember a few years ago there was this case of so-called plague or epidemic of swine flu and vaccinations and Sister Forcades was very much against imposing of the vaccinations on the countries of the European Union. And uh, I think it's important to maintain that our Prime Minister Kopacz was one of those who really refused buying these vaccinations, which turned out to be a good decision. And also, Teresa Forcades... Uh, Yes. And Sister Kokanis also advocates the right to live for every person, but also the right to choose for a, for a woman. And uh, she advocates for the right of abortion in uh, certain cases and the uh, pill the morning after. And uh, as a family, Sister Forcades criticizes, if I'm saying anything wrong, I'll just say, but this is how I understand you as a special hermeneutical moment. <laughs> so, uh, she criticized the patriarchal and misogynist, really, attitude of, or the structure of, of the church, Catholic church. I would also add that other churches are not, that might be similar. So, as I understand, the Sister sees herself under the magisterium, but in the other in the same time you also say that it's important to see the changes within the uh, Catholic Church and one of the results of the churches might be ordination of women, and which uh, might be seen as our contemporary European uh, dimension of uh, liberal uh, of yeah, liberation theology. And uh, The Guardian in 2013 wrote about Sister Forcades as one of the outspoken leaders of Southern Europe far, far left. I like it very much and uh, she has been criticized many times also by the hierarchy of the church. But The Guardian also quotes for a nice answer of Sister Forcades that criticisms are to be expected. I follow somebody called Jesus and he had a lot of it. I really appreciate your, again, courage and your fight for the highest values and I really feel privileged and honored that you are here with us. So can we give a big applause to Sister Forcades? And before we move on to the main part of, of the meeting, I also would like to thank uh, Mr. Edvard Skubich. Uh, who is the spiritus moment of this uh, situation today, yes, it's his initiative and his idea fix uh, that uh, we're meeting today and the system for Cadiz is here uh, with us uh, and that in the future we'll have another wonderful theologians, so chapeau bas and thank you for your uh, wisdom for again your courage and for your well energy and not really giving up you know and cooperation and cooperation and well and you're you're not giving up you know regardless of the circumstances which I think it's really wonderful okay so again thank you very much for coming accepting invitation I'm sure we'll have a wonderful spiritual and intellectual feast ahead of us. Now it's time for me to shut up and to give the uh, uh, mic to uh, Edvard and Sister Forcades. Thank you very much. And thank you also for uh, all of you for uh, coming. Is this working? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. Nice. Um, <coughs> Um, Dr. Sheba has introduced uh, us, so uh, we can very quickly start with uh, our interview. But uh, also, um, we um, preparing our uh, interview. Uh, we agreed that uh, we hope that will be that this evening will be a talk with every one of you. So. Um, <coughs> 
I, I expect of you that maybe after one uh, after half an hour or 20 minutes that you are feeling so, yourself so free for to put a question to Sister Teresa. And um, there is also, uh, when it is um, hard to do that in, um, in English, I can imagine that you hear my English is also very uh, horrible. Uh, so let us improvise and uh, also um, uh, Joe Bruno, uh, he, will, he will assist us with uh, translation uh, because he is uh, like Sister Teresa, very well speaking uh, uh, English. And um, um, so don't hesitate, please uh, uh, enjoy yourself in, in our meeting. Um, it's also uh, necessary to say that um, we now are speaking with each other, with each other about religion and gender. Tomorrow we will be more concentrated about culture and gender, but uh, also it will not be a very uh, different. No. Um, and for that reason, uh, speaking, we, we know we are in Poland. You, know, you are in Poland now. This day you came from Berlin, um, and um, now you are in a, a completely, in my opinion, in a completely other reality. And speaking about the gender, uh, we know in Poland that is, uh, no, it's a hard item, a very difficult uh, item. But not only in, um, in Poland. Uh, Last year, in, there was a United Nations meeting of uh, women, and um, in that meeting, uh, uh, special delegates uh, from Russia, from Indonesia, and from the Vatican, they tried to change some uh, some declarations and to avoid the word of gender. Um, and also, they tried to change, and they succeeded. Uh, not to, uh, they uh, try to change the items as um, abusing a woman, as um, um, homosexuality, and other items who are connected with the rights of uh, every uh, person, uh, and build it, it uh, and to build it on, on the values of family and uh, uh, um, marriage and, uh, and the state and the church who are um, defending family and marriage. So, not only in Poland, but over the world, uh, it's a hard item. And I can imagine myself that between each other, we are having our, every one of you, of us, is having their own feeling about gender. Is it attacking me as a religious person, as a believer? Is it defending me? Uh, what, the, what do I know about the agenda? So for that reason also, I want to invite you to take part in the, in the discussion. It is uh, going about us and not about a strange uh, person living on the moon or something else. And Sister uh, Teresa, uh, starting now, um, I, um, I told you about uh, what, is going, what was going on a year ago in, uh, in New York. Um, do you think uh, gender, the, the, the item gender, the phenomenon of gender, the, um, the way of thinking in, in gender, is that, um, um, as many people are uh, thinking, is it connected with an over, um, over accenting individual freedom? And is it, uh, when we are talking and thinking about gender, is it uh, giving, uh, is, is it attacking the family and the marriage? What do you think about it? Okay, so um, I will give a Trinitarian answer to this, because I didn't mention my doctoral work in theology, is about the Trinity. And to this day, I believe that the Trinity is this fundamental aspect of our Christian theology, or of the Christian theology, that we have not understood yet. And we have not understood yet what it means to have as the horizon of possibility, as the horizon of intelligibility, of comprehension of the world, to have not a stable one, but a dynamic 
dance, a dynamic interaction that includes freedom and includes, that's the most important for me, and I'll get to your question, I'm just... So, includes nine, includes a, a no, a difference. Includes a difference, that's huge change in the philosophical understanding and in the intellectual understanding. We have this long period of pre-Socratic philosophy where the philosophers are trying to find a unity of the world and they give it different names, they can make the fire into that unity or the water or different elements, doesn't matter the name, but searching for a un unity. Later in philosophy, of course, we have different versions of that and always contemporary to all that approaches to the reality that realize the diversity is also ultimate and that oppose diversity to unity. So that's a very well-known phenomenon in the history of philosophy. Well, this Christian idea that you actually cannot separate unity and diversity, that you cannot have the one without the other, and therefore the distinction between unity and uniformity, that's not the same, right? Unity, to be real unity, you need difference, you need diversity. And applying that to the question you were posing to me, for me, it's never enough individualism or individual. It's never, you cannot imagine the life of a society or the life of a family as a middle point between granting the individual its rights and its recognition and its place and also adapting the individual to the group. That's not how it works in the Trinity, as I am taking that theological uh, understanding in the Trinity. The more you affirm the difference and the individuality, that's a word that theologically I cannot use so happily, but so you understand me, right? The personality of each of those three, the greater that is, the greater is the unity. Uh, am I making the point? I mean, is that being clear? It, because that's very important. So we won't get a stronger family by weakening the individual. That's what I'm getting at. And we, of course, won't get a stronger individual by weakening the bond. Or weak so that's our challenge, I think, theologically and also at the human level. But I now formulate that from the Christian tradition. Our challenge is, how do I have in my interior and then how we make regulations and how we live together to understand that defending the place for the individual choice and for the individual, not only right to express oneself in his or her different, but the duty to do that, that only by doing that we are orienting properly the family or the society. I can give an example of that, which is when I, so make it more concrete, when I entered my community, I've been introduced as Benedictine now, and I am, yes, not yet, and that it was 1997 that I entered my community, so it will be almost 20 years. I came from the United States, I'm born in Barcelona, but I had gone there to do my training in medicine, in infectious diseases. And I also started my studies in theology there. When I came to the monastery, the abbess said to me, well, what is your expectation in that first year of living in the community? That we call the postulant year, right? From postulari, you ask to be a nun, you are not yet a nun, but you live with the nuns, you are asking, requesting to be accepted in the community. And I said, well, I expect to come to adapt myself to the ways of the house, right? Because I'm coming from outside, so my first year should be learning how to, uh, how to adapt myself. And the abbess was disappointed at that answer. And then I was puzzled, right? Because I thought, what did I say wrong? Is that not an obvious answer? And then she went on and explained to me, of course I understand what you mean, I appreciate you wanting to fit in, but you know what, I have a dream for our community. And I believe a Christian community and a monastic community is not a place where people come with very different backgrounds and very different uh, experiences of life and ideas, and as we live together, after 20 years, as it is my experience, then we come to think more and more alike. She said, I don't like this. My ideal of our community is we are a place where people come from very different backgrounds and very different experiences, and as we live together, this originality which God gave to each of us, which is peculiar to each person, and it cannot be copied by anybody else, it emerges 
from within the person and it comes to be more and more bold, more and more outspoken, more and more ready to assert itself with all due humility but with all due responsibility. So that, she quoted St. Paul, that's what I think God is expecting from us and this is a huge duty. So you are coming from the United States, I was expecting that you will help me to do this and I'm still trying to do that. <laughs> so to help, so in that sense. Uh, the, the short answer, that was the long answer, the short answer is, I don't think that. Although, I must say, of course there are ways to talk about the individual that are harmful for the community. Of course, I, I know about individualism and I know what it is to educate people in selfish attitudes and to educate people as if I can only take into account who am I, what I want, and regardless of everybody else that I have also experienced in my community sometimes people come that have this type of attitude and then of course that's not doesn't help to live together to put it mildly so i acknowledge individualism but no i don't think that speaking about gender has to be linked to individualism there are people that when they talk about gender they defend individualistic uh, visions of course that happened and there are people that when they talk against gender what they are doing is going against the holy spirit i believe that too Right? So the word gender in itself, for me, it represents something positive. It represents an opportunity to look critically at something very deep and very important that has been neglected in much of the theology. We are talking about theology today or faith. So I believe for the different religions, this is a duty to pay attention to. And it's something that cannot be ignored without harming the own community or religious community. Thank you. Um, maybe uh, I, now I have to ask you uh, to uh, to give your own um, or, or scientific uh, vision about gender, so that we know about what we are talking now. But I can imagine that uh, every one of us is having uh, uh, different um, um, different idea of, of gender. So. Can you say what is for you important speaking about the gender? Mm -hmm. Well, what, <clears throat> when we talk about gender, there is this clear or easy view to explain it as something that takes into account the cultural and the subjective understanding of sexuality or the sexuation more than sexuality. Meaning that in a first approach, that it needs to be also problematized, but at the first approach you could say there is something that you can, might call biological sex. This, I said, it must be problematized because as a physician I could today expose what the differences are between having a chromosomic sex or a gonadal sex or a genital sex. Those are different words, right? Chromosomes, we know about XX, XY, right? And maybe some of you think, at least at the chromosome level, at the genetic level, this is binary, right? People are XX or XY. Well, the answer is no. XX, yes. XY, yes. But also, there are other options that are not so minoritary. I'll give the numbers now. But even if they were, even if only one person in the world would be of a different chromosomic or genetic dotation, that would be, for me, enough challenge for a theological anthropology to take that seriously. Even if it were only one person. So what do we want to do? To have that person adapt to our theory or to have our theory adapt to that person? That's, I think, the Christian answer is, of course, you adapt to the person, right? And you acknowledge that there is a diversity even in the genetic or chromosomic sex sexuation. But as I said, it's not only one individual, that would be enough, but it's not only one of something called XXY, that's Klinefelter syndrome in the medicine, that's one in every 500 uh, newborns. Well, one in every 500 is a lot of people. But as I said, even if it were one, but we are not talking about one person. And we are also not talking about people that you can say, well, they are sick. Well, no, maybe some people are seated here and they don't know it and they have XXY. That has happened, right? Some people don't know it and they have this chromosomic dotation. And there is another one which is X0, X and nothing else. So if we define male and female, female being 2X, male being 1X and 1Y, 
So we are living out of our understanding. Many people that have XXY, what are you, male or female? You have two X, but you have also a X and a Y. So what are you? Or those who are X, zero. What are you, male or female? Chromosomically, there is diversity and there is a difference. But not only that, if we go into the gonadas, it's okay that I go like that? On gonadas, that what it means, gonada, means the ovum or the ovarium or the testicle, right? And in that sense, you might think, okay, that's clear, right? Either you have ovaria or ovaries or you have testicles. Well, also no, there are some cases that have one ovary and one testicle. And again, this is something that might be known, and sometimes it's not known, because it might be cases that I could, I don't want to go that at length now, but just to give you a view that the complexity is true, and it's there. And again, do we want to adapt the complexity to our theory, or the other way around? And finally, of course, genital, you have penis, or you have vagina, and you can differentiate in a binary way like that. Yes, for the majority it's true, but here there is even more complexity, even more diversity. And what it is done today in medical practice is, if there is a newborn that has a penis that is less of two centimeters, then it's considered that it should be raised as a female. Because it's thought, and that is to this day, right, the medical practice, in some places it's been contested, in the United States particularly, but when I studied in the medical school, my degree is from 1990, that was accepted universally, that's what it would be done. Because it was thought you could not have a male without the penis, so then you better raise that newborn as a female. Am I being understood? Yes, it's clear. And if it had, that actually, I said it wrong, that happened if it had less than one centimeter. If it had more than two centimeters, it could be a boy. And if it was between one centimeter and two centimeters, the medical practice is to cut it. So that it is less than one centimeter. Because otherwise it's understood that this newborn will suffer too much. Because it won't fit. Because it will be either too small a penis for a male and too big a clitoris for a woman, so let's cut it. See what I mean when I say, do we adapt the reality to the theory, or we want to go the other way around? I'm talking a reality, I'm talking a surgery, and I'm talking real human lives that now are adults and are complaining about it. Because by cutting such an organ, you might cut out also the possibility of experiencing pleasure in the sexual interaction, and this is something that if you want to do, at least you, could, you should choose yourself not being done because the society has some categories that are so narrow that it will affect your, uh, in this case, not only your pleasure because it can also have pain and it can also have problems about it. So this is to show the complexity only at the biological level. But then, as you also all might be aware of, comes this consciousness of the own sex. Am I a male? Am I a female? And I'm using male and female because I agree, and it's true, and I think also it needs to be acknowledged that for the majority of people, the binary works. That's, that's a reality. It's not binary, it's nothing, it comes from within nowhere. No, we know from where it comes. It's the majority. The majority of people have a binary genetic sex, the majority of people have a binary gonadal sex, and the majority of people have a binary genital sex. And so the majority of people have also binary gender, in the sense that a consciousness, I am a male, a male or I am a female, am I am feminine or I am masculine. But as you also well know, not everybody. So there are people who having a male chromosome, male gonada, male genital, and all that society uh, describes as being male, they have a female consciousness. Right? And this is transsexualism, sometimes called gender dysphoria, but that's discarded now to call it like this because it's more like a medical label. What happens with this? Are we also going to say, okay, we don't want to deal with that and our theology just goes the easy way and it says male, female, enough, don't give me, don't give me trouble. No, I don't think so. What means transsexualism for us? And I will now make the, my theological interpretation of that, right? But first I wanted to set the facts because maybe not everybody is aware of all the details, right? And then the last one, because I'm talking about sex, then gender, and now desire. It's still another level, right? Sex, I mentioned as biological differences. I already spoke about the gender is my consciousness and also the cultural 
attributes that society gives me, right? So the society, if I have an appearance of what normative male, uh, female looks like, it will consider me of a fem female or a fe feminine gender, but also my own consciousness. And the last uh, divide would be desire. And desire, it's also another level of that, because I might be a female that has all the genitals, all the gonadas, all the chromosomes that define the female, but yet, and also have a consciousness of being female, that's the gender, but it has a desire towards female, not towards male. So here we have another challenge for the binary. We challenge the binary on biological grounds, we challenge the binary on subjective consciousness, and we challenge the binary in corresponding desire, in heteronormativity, right? That you desire the person of the other, uh, the other sex is what the binary is supposed to be defending, right? So all this said very quick is the complexity of this issue, and as I mentioned now for the third time, my understanding of anthropology and of theological anthropology is we need to take into account this complexity, and we need to take it into account as it is, which is there is a majority that conform to the binary, but this is not universal. And now comes my theological understanding of this. Well, what does it mean? Why? Is that just that creation went wrong in some cases? And so some people just done, are not okay, right? Are sick. Well, that happens, right? They are problematic. They are different, yes, but they are different in a way that's to be viewed as negative, right? It would be better that they would be like everybody else, right? Is that my theological take on this? Well, in some cases that some chromosomic changes cause a lot of problems. I, of course, I'm in agreement of calling that the disease and, and making something as a treatment if possible, of course. But not in all the cases that I have mentioned to you, many of these people I cannot label as sick because they can have a fully fulfilled, happy life with no other problems but the social ones, the, the refusal of other people. Of course, if they are refused, they are going to have a bad life. They are going to have problems. But wait a minute, what we have to do is not to change the people. We have to change the society so that these people can live in it. My theological understanding is that there is a danger with the binary, which I understand it's there because of the uh, sexual need for reproduction, and this is something that's in itself not problematic. But the danger with the binary is that we limit our understanding of love to complementarity. And that would mean that to love somebody is to love the one that complements what's lacking in me. Right? And so if I am in that sense a woman, so then with a man we can have a complement in the bodies, but we could also imagine, and in fact the anthropology of complementarity, or even the feminism of complementarity that the Vatican is promoting in the last few years, Exactly, it's based on that, that we have a half of the humanity that have a tendency to be more uh, outspoken or more leaders or more to deal with the world, and we have another half of the humanity that actually are to back up the first half, right? And to stay at home or not, but especially to back up, to just devote themselves to the family, to devote themselves to the to the inner circle, and so the other half can go out and do the things, and that's very stereotypical, right? But this is, to this day, a way of looking into it. Well, this problem with complementarity, I think that it happens because to be a sacrament, and the, matter, the marriage is a sacrament of the love of God, right? When you have a sacrament, of what is that the sacrament? So it's a sacrament of, not the theory of the church, but it's a sacrament of the love of God. And the love of God we find in the Trinity. So the love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that also is a love that is towards us uh, in its full potential and in its full capability. The love of the Trinity has nothing to do with complementarity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son, that's the puzzle of Trinity theology in all the, all the history of theology. It's like they are a copy of each other. What do you mean a copy of each other? No, they are very different, but not different in a way that complement each other. It's not that one has what the other one lacks. 
it's that you have another understanding of love which has nothing to do with need or has nothing to do with finding in the other what's lacking in me. It's the same idea that that's traditional theology but I believe very important for today to understand that in Christian theology God does not need the world and this we can understand in ways that need to be nuanced because in Jesus things happen that might challenge that but you know in creation it's not that God needs the world and that's why it creates this utilitarianism that's a very important also challenging cultural um, thinking today and philosophical thinking Christianity is radically against that there is nothing to do with nothing wrong with using things but with people that's absolutely to rule out so God does not create the world to for a need and he doesn't love us for a need therefore it's inviting us to deal with each other out of gratuity, graciousness, yeah, this concept, concept of grace or gratuity, I think it's fundamental, <laughs> the most needed concept in our 21st century. And that is what I believe, the diversity in sexuality, at the biological, at the gender, at the desire level, it's a blessing of God. And it's something that God is has put in the reality of who we are so that we can have a living example, a living challenge of what is our what is too narrow in our understanding of love. Because love, to be real love, to be sacramental love, it needs to be dealing with the other person in what one can am I doing too long? If I because I just I'll finish soon, but I, I say one second, I stand up because it's better I don't see you in a pericoretical way. Perichoresis is this technical word for the Trinity, right? And it comes from the two Greek words, peri and choreo. So peri is the well-known uh, prefix around peri. And then choreo means, can be translated as making space. Ah, for example, in the English word, choreography, right? It's a dance. A choreography is a dance because choreographos is writing, graphos, in the space, a choreography, right? So pericoreo, it means that in the love of the Trinity, if I love you, it means that I am making a space around you. So that you can be what? Whatever you want to be, whatever you are. So it's, it's not the erotic metaphor for love, which is also okay, and the Bible also uses in the Song of Songs, for example, right? This using the desire that a woman has for a man and reciprocity as a metaphor of how God desires us, how God desires the world. Of course, that can also be used. But what's the problem with the er erotic metaphor is that I might desire to go into the other person or I might desire that the other person comes into me violently without the consent of the other person. And we know the rape is like that, right? There is a huge desire of being into the other person, but there is no respect for the other person. And so that's why I like especially that the theology and the theological tradition has used for the Trinity that word perichoresis, which means etymologically to make space around. That's the word that reflects the quality of the love of God, to make space around. And if you have an experience of that, if you have ever experienced that somebody does that to you, then you know what I'm talking about and you know how deeply you can be sure that this is love. Nobody will do that for you for any other reason. Somebody might want you for some other reason. <laughs> might want to go into you or might want that you go into that person for a selfish, needy or other type of reasons. But making a space around you, putting myself at work so that you can be, is like a little bit like in some tribes in Africa or Latin America where they explain that when the foreigner comes they go out on the trails and clean the the woods, right? Because they are so exuberant that in a couple of days you also have no path anymore. So welcoming the other by cleaning the path so that that person can walk, but walk, in this case of the path it has to walk to the town, but I meant to say walk whatever that person wants to walk, right? Am I making sense with this? Okay, because this is my theological foundation of why, why should the reality be like this? I know that this question often is non-answerable, but it's lucid and we keep making that question, right? Why 
is it that if the society can accept male and female, why doesn't everybody fit to male and female? It, it would be much easier, right? Why this complication? Why some people are born with all these changes? And we can think, oh, that's because of human problems and radiations. And okay, we might think like this, but it doesn't seem like that, right? You might have, of course, some man-made problems that cause some genetic alterations, but this seems to have been in nature always. And even in animals, there is this transsexuality. Even I had, well, my family, when I was little, had a dog that was a female dog, but she thought she was a male. And how did I know that? <laughs> because she never told us that. But what she did is that she peed, peed is real, right? Okay, she peed like a dog. But because she didn't have a penis, she was wetting herself every time. So she just raised the leg, and she did it like this, but, but female dogs, they do it in another way, right? Well, what happened to this dog? There are books written about the transsexuality, the animal species, so I don't think it's so easy to discard as something that is caused by the sin of humanity. It would be, that's again, to try to fit reality to our skin, so that our skin doesn't change, and we can sleep at night, right? So there is another approach, which is to say, is it possible that we have to change something of our view of reality? And as I said, what here I think in, it's inviting us in the diversity of this sexual, sex, gender, desire, it's inviting us to do is to broaden the way we understand what is it to love and even in Christian terms, what is it that makes up the sacrament of marriage. That's why I'm one of those defending not only that the church should be the Catholic Church in this case, should be tolerant to homosexuality, for example, and should not persecute or not blame or not consider evil uh, homosexuality, but should bless a homosexual marriage, provided, not at any cost, provided, like the heterosexual, that it is a marriage willing to go on with mutual respect and willing to go on with uh, an understanding that the marriage is within a community, right? That's the same thing that we ask for the heterosexual marriage. It's not anything goes, no, anything doesn't go. But the problem is not whether it is hetero or homo. The problem is whether the quality of this love is one that has what it's needed to be called Christian. And the homosexual in its existence is not holier than the heterosexual, but in its existence, and without taking it into account the moral quality of that or this homosexual person, by itself, by the fact of existing a homosexuality, it's a blessing. Because it's opening up that realm of diversity in a way that I think it's very needed and fruitful for our theological thought. Thanks. You are giving a lot of... Uh, I went long, but it's because... <laughs> no, I was uh, listening to the audience and I uh, understand that uh, we are following you and um, uh, I can also say, uh, in my opinion, that uh, we are very grateful because you are uh, giving us uh, the example of uh, what all, always I call the Procrustus uh, method uh, the, to, to, to put the, the, the reality in my theory and to look for my theory, to, for my theory to the reality. And uh, but also I'm very grateful what you talked about the uh, um, uh, Trinity and that uh, perichoresis. It is, uh, in my opinion, giving a wonderful uh, opportunity uh, for us in, uh, to speak about those things on a constructive and a positive way, <coughs> not only against. But even here, just short, but even here then the heterosexual marriage, which I don't have anything against, of course, but I would have against that the sanctity of that marriage is placed on the complementarity. I have a problem with that. Because the sanctity belongs to God and belongs to what God, what we are like God and what makes us more like God. And it's not complementarity with all due respect because of course I understand at the human level that if I am more outspoken, somebody is more reflective, we can make a good team. Of course that. We complement each other at the human level but that, that is practical but it's not holy. What's holy is that without needing you, I am there for you. That's holy. <laughs> That's another thing. So when I not needing you and not having you fill in my lack, right? I'm still there for you because otherwise, if the sanctity of marriage were 
exactly this complementarity, then of course what happens when one of the two just loses some power to do that, right? And we know, right? It can lose the, the cognition with dementia or it can then the bond is a bit weaker. No, it's not weaker because the bond to begin with, the holiness of the bond was, I'm there for you for no reason, Gra gr graciously, or gra in grace, grace, right? And I was going to say something else, but um, okay, it escaped, but it's on that. On that. Listening to you, uh, still uh, I'm wondering uh, myself, and maybe you can react about it, uh, for what reason the fear, as well in culture as this evening in in religion, religious uh, groups uh, for those, uh, uh, as well for gender as for uh, feministic uh, theology. Uh, I'm listening to you are giving, a wonderful, in my opinion, a wonderful possibility to think of, uh, in a positive way about those things. But uh, um, now the, th the theology of Trinity is well known, um, but uh, still uh, the uh, the Holy See is, is provoking fear for the gender theology and fear for the feminist theology. For what reason that fear? Okay. So here I and then would like to, to then mention, uh, if I can do it shortly, that after I've done all this passionate defense, right, the one that I think is uh, necessarily the way of looking at this issue that is not narrow and it's it, acknowledges the complexity of reality, but now I would like to develop also what I think is not the right approach to this, which is, well, I'll first defend is still another word that has not appeared, which is the word queer, that some people use nowadays as queer theory, and of course those are only words and you can just use them and discard them, they are not like people, right? But as I understand queer, I use it, and sometimes I say I do queer theology, and this I use because I think the theological anthropology that I feel it's the more adequate to the Christian message is that one that says, as I said, as my abbess told me 20 years ago, each person is in its or her or his own, it's a unique piece, it's an original concretion, concretion made concrete, in time and space, the love of God. That's each person and God loves us like that. God looks at us like that and sees the uniqueness in each person. Doesn't say, oh, female, male, Polish, German, and Jew, and Greek, and Lord, and slave, and male and female, right? I'm quoting Galatians chapter 3, 28. So why in Christ Jesus there is no Jew and Gentile, there is no uh, how do I say this? There is no lord and slave, there is no female and, me and male. What does it mean, right, this passage? Uh, of course we have other passages and now we can start the war of passages, one against the other, because that's not the only, the only one in the Bible. But let me just say short one, I, I like to stand because I, <laughs> I mean that's a conversation but I feel it's also, right, so I don't see you. Just short, because when I mention some of the biblical passages, I also want to give a very clear example to show how clear it is. I'm speaking about the Catholic Church and the right uh, evangelical, so you have your own way to deal about it, but the example would be from the Catholic Church. There is no excuse to say, oh, it's in the Bible, because we are already using those passages of the Bible that we think in our responsibility, communities of the 21st century inspired hopefully by the Holy Spirit and no by fear and no by need to adapt to the times but inspired by what we recognize as the Holy Spirit in the church, we are already necessarily and have always done a selection of texts. And the example that I use because it's very striking, it's, and we just have now celebrated the Easter, right? So on that most holy night of Easter, in the Easter Vigil we have the seven readings from the Old Testament and the last of that seven readings is from Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, that's chapter 36, if you want to then go home and look it up, it's 36 and then from verse 16 to 28, that's the reading, but actually that's not the reading, because if you look at the Catholic lectionary for that night, it says, it will be read, Ezekiel 36, 16 to 17a, 18 to 28. 
So, of course, my question was, what does it say in 17b? 17b is being left out, right? And not only 17, one verse, but it's half of a verse is being left out. What, that happened to me actually one of the years at the monastery when I was preparing for the readings, right? Then I noticed that and I thought, okay, I was reading the lectionary directly, so I went to the text of the Bible and I discovered what it says in 17b. And if you look it up at home, then I won't tell you now, so you go and look. No, no, I won't. <laughs> so, uh, Ezekiel in this reading is saying, well, my people, right, you have gone to other, uh, with other peoples, right, you have gone in Zion, you have gone across the earth, and wherever you have gone, you have defiled me, you have betrayed me. Is that passage where Ezekiel then says, I will turn your heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Right? That's a beautiful passage and very important passage. But 17b is when after 17a, God having said that you have defiled me, 17b says, like a woman that menstruates. That's 17b. And the Catholic Church doesn't dare in the 21st century to just say that in the most holy night. Of course not. And I applaud that, right? I don't think we should say that and then say word of God. This is the whole congregation having heard that in the mouth of God, it's put that you are so despicable as a woman who menstruates, and so dirty as a woman who menstruates. Of course, we don't have to read that. But see my example, we are choosing that as a church, and we are living out the passage because we believe this passage, it's not the word of God. We believe this passage, and here I'm using the classical notion of biblical inspiration in the Catholic Church, which is, the Bible is not dictated by God. The Bible is inspired by God, who has an unlimited intelligence, unlimited love. That's God. But it's inspiring people who had limited intelligence, and limited love. And so the result is something that contains the word of God, but not in every single passage, right? And other people that also have limited intelligence unlimited love, also inspired by God that has unlimited intelligence and unlimited love, we do what we can with this text and we are responsible for doing what we can and in fact we are doing that. So this is in the Catholic Church not a question, could we live out, we are doing it. The problem is, why are we living out Ezekiel 36, 17b, like a woman who menstruates, you defile, and we are not living out the women should be silent in the church. Why are we using that one? Well, it's our choice, so at least know that, right? That we can choose otherwise if we so decide, because we are already doing it. So that was to answer what? <laughs> to, to one second, because... <coughs> My question was for what is in that fear. Yes. Yes. So, yes. So the, the, the thing I was going to say is that sometimes with this queer idea that each person should be viewed as an original concretion of the love of God in time and space. But now here comes for me a fundamental point. And the fundamental point is the human, the human, mm, not only project, the human plenitude and the human realization, right? That what makes us human and our realizing in time and space being made the image of God, that is something that we are not born with our final, so to speak, identity. We are born with a potential, right? Here I can quote Thomas Aquinas, or I can quote this classical distinction between image and likeness in the Bible, right? When it says, human beings made at the image and likeness of God. And Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century had used that two words that we know from the Hebrew that usually they are only the so-called Hebrew parallelism that uses twice the same idea. It doesn't want to say two things, it's just using it as we say very, very good. So okay, it says the same thing twice. But this had led to mistakes, like when it says that Jesus was like mounted on two beasts. Well, that example I don't give now, I don't develop. But you know about parallelisms in the archaic, right, Semitic language. So probably that's all it is, right? Image and likeness in the Hebrew original probably only wants to, to say the same thing twice, so to say very much like God, right? But in the tradition, the theological tradition of this, uh, the Catholic Church, or Thomas Aquinas had used that, 
He was studying at the time the Aristotelic philosophy of potentiality and act, right? So he used that to say the image is what God has given to each one of us, which we can never lose. So the image of God is our basic identity. That's who we are. It's made to the image of God, which means made, as Augustine had said, capax day. Capax day is able to love and able to be free and able to know. Okay, so that's who we are essentially. Those are words of Thomas Yates. Now, but whether that will be realized in time and space, that is not a matter of what God does. That's a matter of what do we, of what we do. That's our responsibility, to bring that image into likeness, to realize that potential. Because it is clear, maybe, it is clear to all of those who, who are here today, that human beings have potentiality for love and for freedom. But it must be, of course, also clear that we don't always realize that. And you look around and you see that, right? That it's not love and freedom what it abounds in the world. It's not what we see in every interaction. And even it's not what we do in every interaction, to be loving and to be free. So this realization of a potentiality is what Thomas uses to say the likeness. So the image and the likeness. But there is a space between the image and the likeness, and that space is the space of our responsibility. Okay, apply to gender, because that's what we are talking about. We start, I believe, that's here my position, right, about it. We start, I believe, as children, with a binary. Also, there might be exceptions to what I'm going to say now, and for me, I said before already, the exceptions are not a problem, are a blessing, so we understand to think wider. But my understanding, why the fear, right? That's what I'm trying to answer now. I understand, as children, we have an identity which is called the childish identity or the, yes, the infantile identity, the child identity, has as a referen reference point to know who am I as a child, I have a reference point and that is the mother. Yes. The mother, the mother, this place, this body and this being in which they have been nine months, right? And you might say, well, what about if you have been moved from your mother? Okay, but then I take a substitute of the mother. But still, I have a reference which is very so deep that I now, I'm sorry that I'm going so long, but it's for me very important so you understand how I think about it. I make briefly, but some medical experiments that have now very much validated, one of them it was published in 1989, that's in the, in the magazine Science, Casper and Fifford, if somebody wants to look. This is an experiment done with newborns that were not allowed to listen to the voice of their mother in the first 24 hours after having been born, right? So you have somebody being born and the voice of the mother, the mother agreed for 24 hours not to uh, speak to the newborn. And this newborn was given a, how do you say that, a pacifier, right? Pacifier connected to a measuring the pressure, the pressure of the sucking of the baby. Normally, the baby, newborn baby, sucks in what we call a paroxysmal pattern, which is the baby is quiet and then suddenly does very quickly, right? The sucking, okay, and that was being registered. When the baby did that, which is the normal sucking pattern, the voice, that, that measurement of pressure was linked to a recorder that was able to produce the voice of the mother, the recorded voice of the mother. But when the baby was sucking in the normal way, the voice being produced was the voice, if this is baby number one, was the voice of mother number two. If it's baby number two, the voice of mother number three. So not your mother, the mother of another baby. Only when the baby, by chance, did a binary pattern, basically two, in a pause, right? When that happened, the recorder changed and it appeared the voice of that baby. Is that clear, the setting of the experiment? Okay, so that is a clear setting of conditioning, Pavlovian con conditioning in, in science. In less than 24 hours, the majority of the babies learned to suck in a binary pattern. Change the way of spontaneous, and those are newborn babies, the first day of life. And in less than 24 hours, they were sucking like this. <laughs> and 
I'm making exaggerated, but you see, waiting for that voice. So the conclusion of Casper and Pfeiffer is babies know their mother's voice before having heard that voice extra uterus. And not only know it, but it's a drive for them of a strength comparable of the strength of a piece of meat for a hungry dog, which is the original experiment of Pavlov, right? Well, I said that quickly, but that's very important because from the moment and they have said that right at the beginning, so none of the arguments that now I'm putting forward uh, for me are to be used to uh, deny this responsibility of women to think whether they want to be mothers or not. And you've already exposed, right, that I have written about abortion, so don't take it in that sense. But my position of uh, about abortion is, of course, not one of saying, oh, yes, abortion. Anybody, any woman who wants to do can do and that's not a problem. No, I don't think it's not a problem, but I don't think the state should be deciding whether a woman needs to be a mother. My wish would be that every woman, and there are some medical cases where it's your life or the life of the baby, right? And other complicated cases. But if it is not one of those complicated medical cases, and even, because I know so, some examples in the case of rape, I would like that every woman would be ready to take that situation that should have never happened and uh, it would be of course fundamental that we do all we can so that it never happens and speaking about rape, about becoming pregnant without wanting it, take that situation and turn it because that's the basic dynamic of Christian life. It's like turning something that you have not wanted, that's what God does with us all the time. This is what I would like to happen but I'm not in favor that the state has the power to put a woman in prison, if that woman says thank you for your, uh, for your, uh, how is that, your counsel, but I'm going to do otherwise. See what I'm saying, my position, what it is, right? And also, so, because that's an important thing, and I say only briefly, when I was in 2009, the announced role for having voiced my view on that issue, I received a letter saying I should retract, take back what I had said, and then I sent a letter explaining what I'm going to explain to you briefly now that went to Rome in 2009 and for now no answer has come. So I don't know if tomorrow I receive an answer but for now since 2009 what I'm going to explain to you now has not been deemed or answered with, a, with a, any kind of strife so I have never been disciplined right by the Vatican. I, and what I answered or what I wrote to them is if you have a father uh, that has a child that needs a kidney transplant. And this is not a theoretical example. Only in the United States you have more than 90,000, more than 90,000, not children, but people waiting for a, a kidney transplant. And of course, of those, three to 4,000 die every year because nobody gives the kidney, right? I even knew in Catalonia an example of a Jesuit that was waiting for the kidney transplant and let me tell you that not all their Jesuits' brothers had offered to give, right? So that's interesting. But three to four thousand die every year. Not all of them children, but some of them children. So let's take that case that you are a father, a Catholic father, you have a child that needs a kidney transplant and can die if it, the kidney transplant doesn't happen. And you have a kidney that is compatible, right? Okay, does the Catholic Church, is the Catholic Church ready to force you under uh, imprisonment punishment to give that kidney to the child? The answer is it's not. That's not happening. I'm not saying, why then? What's the morality behind that? What's the moral reasoning? Why the Catholic Church feels its duty to impose on the mother something that I consider good, which is to just give that birth and to carry on that pregnancy, but what I consider bad is to impose the imposition. Am I making clear here? So why does, on the what, understanding of bioethics or better said, of moral theology, is the Catholic Church ready to impose on the mother what it does not require of the father? And my little note that I didn't write on that letter but that I can share with you now is nowadays medically it is possible to give a kidney even if you are more than 70 years old. So all bishops should start giving a kidney. That's my point. Before you go into a demonstration of people that are uh, pro-life or that are criticizing the women 
that do abortion as being inhuman, as being assassins or as being uh, criminals, right? So before you do that, you should because you can, because many of these banners say if I could with my body give a life, I would of course do it. So you have a duty to do that, right? Okay, so sometimes some people that have written to me with that, I have answered to them and said, so you know what, even if you are a male, you can do it. You can give a kidney and you can save a life. So I, for, for, and up to now, I have not become any answer of anybody that says, okay, I've, I've, I've done that. So I think it's a hypocrisy and it goes back to the gospel when it says, you impose heavy burdens on the people and you don't want to move them with one finger. And being clear, I am against, in the sense, in the sense of considering it something good, against abortion. But I am even more against of having this imposition that's partial imposition, that's on the mother, not on the father, and that it's made from a position of security that does not even risk your own kidney because that you might think some of you and I'll finish with that part now that that's too far off an example because giving a kidney is not like giving birth giving birth is something natural and you are uh, kept the same right your bodily integrity giving a kidney you are uh, mutilated for life well let me tell you the mortality and the morbidity of giving a kidney today first of all the scar it's much smaller because it's run by episiotomy, by uh, laparoscopy, it's much smaller than the normal scar for a giving birth that's done the episiotomy. And the morbidity and mortality of giving a kidney nowadays is much less than the morbidity and mortality of giving birth in normal circumstances, even more if you have certain risk pregnancies or if you are psychologically distressed because of other issues that might be going on. So that would be my point. And I'm not the, uh, in a certain way, finish with the fear. <laughs> yes, but um, I will continue my question about fear. But so, um, but, uh, please feel you free to. Yes, Susan? Uh, just a follow up question about you mentioned uh, maybe you uh, don't come here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Just as a Catholic theologian asking. Um, you mentioned uh, Rome and uh, being asked by Rome, and I guess they are maybe they they don't know how to answer. But uh, but we, when we are speaking here, it feels that we are speaking so freely, and we are speaking so lightly. I mean, with the awareness that it may be a controversy, but still here it sounds so lightly. But very often here in Poland, uh, in other places, when we discuss those things, there is a there, there is a heavy burden of discussing as a Catholic theologian feminist Catholic theologian with the awareness that whatever you say can be reported to Rome and you may have a problem. And we have a list of Catholic theologians, feminist Catholic theologians being already you know, in the troubles uh, before and, and probably in the future. So how do you how do you build your academic career and uh, your spiritual life in the church when you know that you're playing this the game all the time? And how do you play this game smartly? Is it a game? Um, you know, how, how, to, how to navigate, basically. Okay, so, <clears throat> yes, um, I don't know if there is a rule that can, I don't know if there is a rule that can apply to everybody, probably not, for what I said, but at least from my experience, I can say that I consider very important to be careful when I speak, but not careful out of fear, that I don't say that sometimes you have to be smart in that way, but the first carefulness is not out of fear. <laughs> doesn't have to be like this. The first carefulness is because what you know is only what you know, right? Your little brain, or I said before, God is unlimited intelligence, unlimited goodness, I'm not. So that's very important for me, right? So when I talk, I might talk passionately, I might talk, right, with all my strength, but I'm not sure if I'm right. That's the first thing, because I've been proven wrong before, right? And even by my sisters in the community all the time. So that's the first step. And I think it, it's very important for me to say, the, listen, this is when I think about it, and that's what I answer also to this. That's a public document, so I can give you this, this answer, because it's, it's been published. So my first point was this one, to say, in the Catholic Church, I, I come from a family that's not very religious, right? So when I was little, that was the time of Franco in Spain, I was nine years old when the fascist dictator died. And my family were not anti-church, but they thought of the Catholic Church as the monarchy. 
as institutions that are there, but they are like dying, they are like outdated, and they, you just don't need to pay attention to them, right? So I grew up like that, not thinking against the Catholic Church, but also not paying attention. When I was 15 years old, I read the Gospels, and they made a big impact in me. Why? I cannot explain, but I can say that it was like this. I finished reading that, and I was so upset, because I thought, I've lost 15 years of my life not knowing that, right? That was my experience. So, but I, I'm mentioning this because that's what I wrote to this, this answer to Rome. It's like, I've known the Catholic Church, I've known a stereotype of what the church was supposed to, be, to do, and then I've gotten to know many people that are engaged with the poor and that engage with the situations in life where the people are suffering the more. And I've known the Catholic Church as a place where you can be free, where you can be true to who you are, and a place where nobody will never ask you to say something you don't believe. Another thing is if I say this is the truth and all the bishops are wrong and all Rome is wrong and I have the truth, okay, maybe that would be too much to say, but it's not out of fear that I don't say it, it's, it's because I don't think I can say it and it makes any good to me to believe that I have the truth, right? But it does make a good to me and I believe I can always stand up to that to say, listen, if you ask me, because all this happened not because I wanted to make my big point about abortion or there wasn't an interview on the TV and the man there asked me. So what should I say? Mm. Suddenly I have no word to say, oh, you're a doctor, and what do you think about it? Well, I'm asked, I answer with what I think. And the church, official church, can say, this woman says it's wrong, and I'll accept that. I say, well, why I think it's not, but I won't say, no, you are wrong, I won't engage in that, that type of thing, because from where can I do that, right? But if I'm being asked what I think about something, I feel, and up to now it has happened, I can come back to the institution, the Catholic Church, and say, wait a minute, what do you mean? That's what they said. They said, you have to retract what you said. And what I answer is, you don't want me to say A when I believe B. You are not asking me to lie, are you? Because you are not asking me to do an act of dishonesty. If you are saying, say that you don't have the truth, I'm ready to do that any time, of course. I don't have a problem with that. If uh, um, they made me say you are not the one having to um, set up magisterium for the whole church, okay, where do I have to sign? Of course not, and thanks be to God, I'm not the one, right? It's quite complicated. But if I'm being asked, what do you think about it? It's either I say nothing, which is not very nice, because then people say, oh, the Catholic Church is being irrelevant. Of course, they don't engage with the things, right? Or I'm going to tell you what I think, and you can come up, and even when I, when I speak as a theologian, because I'm not only a Catholic, I'm a theologian, and your question was including the theologian. What I believe I have the responsibility to do as a theologian is to also, for the audiences, especially if they are non theological audiences, to set up what the official teaching is, right? Okay, the official teaching is this, and then if I believe there are points that I see differently, then I must say them. And I think this is, I know, a discussion in the church is the dissenting, the capacity to dissent in the church, and if you do it, in good faith, right? And if you do it in an uh, honest way, even if it's not reasonable, right? It should be, I don't think it can harm the church. They, I don't have any teaching position and I might not have any, so if I were teaching in a seminary, maybe I, it's either I would be ready to risk my teaching position or I would just uh, have to be careful in the way you said, out of fear, right? So, but I'm not aspiring at a career, <laughs> so that's a good thing. But the problem I acknowledge, of course. And of course, then I think what we should do is to work so that theology can be in the civil university. Right? That's a practical point. <laughs> because otherwise, I'm saying I'm not doing it as a career, but I'm sorry that many young women that I know, they would like to study theology professionally, but then they say, okay, how am I going to earn a living? So that's a problem. But I don't see that resolved by opening up the seminaries only, which I would like to see, but I'm not expecting that any soon. So I think it would rather be the acknowledgement by the civil universities that theology is a discipline that should be, that actually in the United States is like that, right? That's why Elizabeth Schussler, Fiorenza, for example, uh, moved there because in Germany as a feminist theologian she couldn't find any position, right? So, but at this moment, uh, this is the, I want to, to, to put a question, if you allow me. Um, reflecting about it, what you said, and uh, the question of uh, Susanna. Um, 
maybe one of the last uh, questions because uh, you'll be, uh, I can imagine that you are very tired. Um, the fear, I'll speak, I'll, I'll yes, speak tomorrow. The fear, no, no. Uh, uh, I am aware that continuously we are speaking about religion and culture. Thinking about those um, um, men like uh, some presidents of uh, Indonesia and uh, uh, Senegal and uh, Russia, speaking about Mr. Putin, and also connected with some patriarchal, pat um, yeah. patriarchal uh, persons from uh, the Vatican who are uh, continuously uh, putting the woman in their role. And then I'm thinking, are we speaking about culture or religion? I don't know. But uh, um, connecting with your last word about university, um, thinking about our uh, four famous Protestant Breslau uh, theologians, um, uh, at first, at its time, uh, she was a marvelous uh, theologian, and she was having the guts uh, to, to think about the position of women as in culture, as well in culture, as in church. And she was thinking very uh, provocative. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, was also very provocative in his time, not about gender, because it was um, in, he was connected with those uh, items. I know there are a lot of professors and theologians now who are connecting, uh, reflecting about Bonhoeffer. Uh, but my question is this. There are universities, uh, state universities, also in the United States, so in the Netherlands, um, where also women can go and study theology. But on many of those uh, universities, they are um, reading Bonhoeffer and Edith Stein and they are explaining them in a very um, conservative way. And um, they have the right to do that, uh, so as everyone has the right to, to explain the Bible. And we can use the Bible if we want, uh, we'll open and progressive or conservative way. Maybe those words, conservative and progressive, are uh, also. Um, uh, not good, but uh, uh, for me, uh, and now I will repeat my, my question about fear, from which, uh, where from, for what reason people are having that fear against, uh, and let's not only speak about uh, gender, but also about women who are developing themselves, who are um, uh, thinking, who are thinking critically and who are demanding a place for them. For what reason also on that university they are... So I'll try to do that short because my answer to the fear, I've of course engaged with that in depth and when I explained the thing about Casper and FIFA and the baby I was preparing the thing but that takes a bit longer so I'll do it short. But short would be maybe quoting Julia Kristeva you might know this uh, Lacanian psychoanalyst that uh, uh, well uh, has devoted herself a lot about this topic and one of her sentences that I like to quote is when she says that we all of us, male and female, right, and, and queer and in between and all, all the diversities, all of us have had as a child the body of a woman at our disposal to satisfy us physically and emotionally. And you might say, well, if somebody has been only geared or, or raised by a male, okay, maybe not all of us, but the majority, let's say, right? To understand the cultural problem, right? To understand that. Okay, what happens is that as adults, and that's why I started with Thomas Aquinas, with the starting and the whole thing, that we need to change this psychology of the child that has as a reference the mother to move into a psychology of the adult. And the best way I have to, to exemplify that is with Johannes chapter 3. This is the conversation with Nicodemus, where Jesus says, you have to be born again, right? And Nicodemus, right away, what does he say? Oh, go back into the mother? Is that possible for an adult? And Jesus is like, no, no, not to the mother. With all due respect for the mother, I have nothing about, right? I mean, the respect for the mother and all the role it has, but wait a minute. 
adult life is not to go back to the mother, right? So the second birth, the baptism, the becoming a member of the church, it means to orient yourself, not regards the figure of the mother that you needed as a child. And I think that's the starting point for all of us. And I don't think we can abolish that, and it would be good to abolish. It doesn't mean that the father should not be more involved in that. That's their separate issue. But in the adult life, what Jesus says is to be born of the water and the spirit, right? This, this allegory for the baptism, or this reference for baptism. Well, what does it mean? I don't know what it means, but for each of us, it means to grow out of the childhood psychology, to grow out of this childhood where you have the reference of mother and towards her, you are either like her or not. That's the childish, and that's why for children it's very traumatic. If you have a child that needs a boy to dress him as a girl, and for a girl, it's less traumatic because of society, but it's also traumatic for a girl to have her unless she wants to, and she's playing with this. Because for children, that's very really key for their psychology to know whether they are like the mother or not. And transsexual children, and that's a very interesting topic to think, together with the queer um, aspects that I developed before, is that that would be against the people that think that gender and the stereotypes of gender are just culturally made. Period. Of course, they are culturally made. I would never contest that, but I contest the period. It's not only culturally made, period. It's culturally made starting with something that I think is trans uh, cultural, and that's Julia Kristeva also, right here. And what is trans cultural is that fact that you came out of a body that is called a woman, and it could be called something else, but it doesn't matter. It's called a woman, and certain bodies are supposed to be able to do that, and other bodies are not supposed to be able to do. And there are people that look like they could and they cannot, and the other way around. But this easy dichotomy, that belongs to the childhood psychology. And the adult psychology has to move away from this. But to move away, if you know a bit of the Lacanian, psychoanalysis or the Lacanian way of thinking about subject and subjectivation. It doesn't mean to go away when you are 18 years old and then you move away from the childhood, or when you are 12, or when you are 24. It's not you move away and then you are beyond. You have to move away from the childhood psychology every time you subjectivize yourself, every time you act. Every time you act, you have a possibility, a dichotomy, which is to act according to this impulse this inertia that you have from the childhood, or to act in a new way, in a creative way, in a responsible way, in a free way, in a divinized way. This theosis of the patristic theology, we are called to be like God, and God is pure act. God is not moving by inertia, he's making every time something new, it's like a love, and it's like a kiss, that it's never the same one. That sounds very poetical and very nice, but in the practice we tend to inertia, right? It's like, okay, I kiss that person this way, so the same day do the same thing. No, that needs to be new. I looked at you the same way than yesterday. No, it needs to be new if I am alive, right? So that, that sounds very good, maybe theoretically. We are not up to the challenge, and here, here comes Julia Kristeva again. She thinks, as adults, we generally behave reasonably until we are challenged. Challenged by what? By circumstances that makes us insecure. Right? It can be losing your job, it can be like having a, a defeat, it can be a failure of any kind. And then it's when we have a regression to this childhood world. And in that childhood world, and now comes the point of the fear, the mother is the caregiver. And if you are not careful and move with this inertia of childhood, there is an expectation that is shared by male and female, right? It would be an expectation of the male towards the female, but also an expectation of the female to herself, to take more responsibility for the care, the well-being of the other person. It's like a regressed male would have the tendency to expect for the woman they love that they take care of him, which is not reasonable in adults, but that's why I'm explaining this psychology in a ways that are a bit more nuanced. But here's the point. It's not corresponding. The woman, in a regression mode, would also expect her to be the one taking care. It's not expected. It's not the other way around. It's not for all adults going backwards in the childhood. Is I expect you to take care of me, you expect me. No. For all adults going backwards is we expect the mother. Who is the mother? Okay. You, not you. You. <laughs> the one who looks like her, right? The one who is a mother, a real one, maybe a wife, 
or the mothers in the community, or the one who might be a mother, or the one, right? This cannot be explained so quickly, but am I making sense a little? So the thing would be then, for example, to, to make it into a, an example that's more illustrative, the witch hunt. Some people still today think it's a medieval thing, right? Well, it's not that we know, right? The phenomenon, it's not a medieval phenomenon, it's at the beginning of modernity that it happens. In the medieval times, in the 10th century, there is a papacy, Budla or Bula Papal, uh, yeah. that says whoever believes in witches, he or she should be condemned because that's crazy, right? How can you have a woman having a pact with the devil and even a sexual pact? That's ridiculous, right? That's the 10th century. The University of Paris in the 14th century says there are women who have packs with the devil and it distinguishes between the black magic and the white magic. That's a university who does that. Why am I saying this? Because Zika is one of the ones who has studied that the most, understands that the witch hunt happened at the moment of so-called social anomie, which is a moment of deep social transformation, the equivalent of a personal crisis for an adult that I was mentioning, mentioning Cristela. When you have a problem that you don't have resources to deal with, as a human being, psychoanalysts and psychologists help us understand there is a movement of regression, right? You go back. And also, little parenthesis, if you have always or ever worked with battered women, women that suffer gender violence, I've done that in Boston, and I've met people who do that in Barcelona and in Japan, and it doesn't matter if it is Boston, Barcelona, or Japan, everywhere, the first most prominent feeling of a woman who has been uh, attacked by a beloved one, the prem, you know what, what does that feeling is, right? Do you know it? The most prominent, you are a woman who has been attacked by somebody you trust, you love, your partner, or somebody very close to you, and what is the first feeling or the more predominant feeling that you have? Okay, guilt. Doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. You should be enraged. You should be upset because somebody has done to you something absolutely outrageous. You should be upset. Why are you guilty? Why is in Japan, in Boston, in Barcelona, why are these women guilty? And the male, the male when he does that, many times he comes also, at least that happened to me in Boston, he comes with a woman to the place. Because, as you know, this is not a relationship that all the time it's violent. It's violent and then it's, I'm sorry, I'm going to kill myself if you leave me and I'm, I'm there for you and I'm, right? It's, it's up and down, up and down, and that's one of the problems. Okay, so the man sometimes comes also. And what's the predominant feeling on the man? It should be guilt, right? But it's not. It's rage. The man is enraged, as one of them told me, said, Doctor, you don't have a clue how much I love this woman. If I've done that to her, and he didn't deny that he had done it, it's because somebody has done to me something much worse. Somebody meaning the society, the boss at work, the whomever. So the predominant psychological, intimate, subjective feeling of the male that exerts violence on a woman is rage. Somebody has done to me an injustice, and look at what I have done as a consequence, right? And the primary feeling of the woman is guilt. Okay, so that I bring back to this, going back to this in childhood consciousness, that makes, otherwise I don't understand that, right? And I, I, it's much more complex, but, so you see a little bit how I think about it. That if it's true that in the childhood we have this identification, then in so much, and this is not a must, but in so much the adult woman is still identified with the childish consciousness, she will have a tendency to feel guilty if she cannot take care of the emotions of the male that she loves, males and females, but especially the males. And in so much, it's not a must, but it happens, in so much the adult male is still identified with the childish psychology, he, for more he has studied or PhDs he has, he will have a tendency to expect that taking care of a woman. So here comes my point, the problem with the patriarchal society is the society that says, this differentiation in childhood should go on all the life. It's the, the good thing if it happens all the life. And the anti-patriarchal society says, no, that should change in the adult life. Of course, patriar patriarchy shouldn't happen in the infancy either, but you see what it should change in the adult life. It's not patriarchy that shouldn't exist, if possible. It's the consciousness we have. The consciousness of being, identifying our subjectivity 
with regards to a woman. And that's why in the icon of Mary, like Mary the mother of God, I love it actually, and I know that from feminist perspective sometimes that has been criticized, but I find that extremely liberating for that perspective that many of the ancient icons of Mary, Mary is doing like this and pointing at the child, right? Like, hey, I'm off of the hook, right? <laughs> Don't look at me, I'm not the one, look at that. And he's not pointing to a birthed male, old male, he's pointing to a child, right? So this incarnation of the most holy power in something that we consider vulnerable, and something that can be held, in something that is fragile, and something that's counter-cultural. But also Mary says, don't look at me, don't look at the female, don't look at the mother. Oh yes, the goddess is how nice. Well, not for me, they are not that so nice. Because I believe we have a need to break with this idea that the mother is the reference. It's not the mother, it's not the father understood as in patriarchy, but it's this trinity that is a mess. I already said that, right? Mm -hmm. This trinity that is able to upset and challenge completely, we take it seriously, in a pericoretical way, all our notions. And the more you let this trinity inspire you, so the less fear you will have. But we, unfortunately, have churches and societies that are still living out of the inertia of this childhood paradigm, and that's why I think it's fear. You give me an answer, uh, uh, not only uh, what, from what is in the fear, but also how to deal with the fear. Uh, Susanna, um, I didn't ask you, do you uh, uh, agree with your, uh, the answer you got from uh, Sister Teresa? But in my opinion, what she now told was also a connection, a continuation of your question. Um, I'm feeling myself obliged to, uh, to, uh, to finish now. Uh, seeing you, seeing you, um, uh, we, we, at least we need to break. Uh, but uh, tomorrow we are on the four, uh, two o'clock in the House of Peace. It is on Roquette Capiens. We will continue our meeting. Um, I want to uh, thank you and uh, thank you. Uh, and at this very moment, only I want to to to, say, uh, to, to finish with one short um, uh, memory in my in my mind. Um, Twenty years ago uh, in, in the Netherlands, I'm from the Netherlands, uh, I remember I took part in a, in a, a church meeting uh, organized by a Protestant uh, a woman. And for me as a Catholic boy, it was so marvelous how three Protestant women uh, provided uh, the, um, the Eucharistie. I know in Catholic uh, tradition it's hard to say that, but for me it was a, a, a relief. That obligation uh, is not only on uh, men, but you can share that with women. And those strong uh, women, they show that. This evening I saw a woman, a doctor, and uh, the, a medical, medical uh, euphemist, medicine, and a theologist, uh, theologian, and um, you uh, give me a lot of joy, and I want to thank you for for that, and hoping tomorrow to to uh, to talk more, and also every one of you, thank you very much, and thank you very much, uh, to Sherpa for the hospitality. Okay, you want to say? I also would like to thank, and uh, as I understand, it's the <coughs> it's the end of the formal part of the meeting, but there is an informal part which my Take much longer time actually. There's a little bit of food and uh, coffee and tea prepared there, so please feel invited.